Let's see if we have any questions on stuff over the weekend. You should have completed 36 through 53 in your review, although based on the homework checks I've been doing this morning, uh, I would guess maybe a quarter of us actually did that. So I don't know if there's like a motivation problem or an understanding problem, but if you have questions on stuff, we can handle a couple of those right now. So motivation problem then? Give yourself a big swift kick in the butt here. The school year's not over yet. Even if you're a senior, we still got uh, too much time anyways to uh, be checked out already. You know what I mean? Yep, N36 through 53. Yep. Yeah, what would you like to do, Jack? I'd be happy to do one. Okay. Uh, are we talking question A or, or question three or four or five? Because they all have part C's to it. Question three? Okay. So you're talking about this fella right here, correct? Okay. All right. So the first thing I notice is that I have a one of the zeros that I'm given is a complex zero. So I know because of the complex conjugates theorem, I also have to have its conjugate on my list or else when I multiply this out, I won't get real coefficients. So I'm going to add that guy to my list. And then I'm going to create my factors. So x minus 4 is going to give me the factor x plus 4. 1 minus i is going to give me the factor x minus 1 minus i. And x plus or 1 plus i is going to give me the factor 1 minus x or 1 plus i. Okay with this so far? Okay, notice all I'm doing is basically subtracting the zero from x, right? That's what, how I'm getting the factors. These two that are conjugate pairs, I'm going to multiply together. I'm just going to leave that other fella alone. So I'm going to foil these out. I'm going to treat these complex numbers as like one thing, though. So when I foil, I'm going to do like x times x. And then x times 1 plus i. And then I'll have x times 1 minus i. Then I'll have 1 minus i times 1 plus i. OK, so far? So then let's just distribute these x's through. Boop, 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 boop. Because all I'm really doing now is just combining some like terms. And then this piece, I'm going to foil out. Um, but I notice that this is really a difference of two squares. So I can actually shortcut through foiling that out and just write it as a squared minus b squared. Now you could foil it out, it's not really that much more work, but if I'm in the game of saving myself some aggravation, you know, I'm just going to save myself a little aggravation there, you know what I mean? So far so good? Doing okay? You stop me if I do something weird, right? Okay. Um, I remember that i squared is negative 1, and now I'm just going to kind of combine my like terms up here. So I have a minus ix and a plus ix. Those cancel out. And then I have my x squared 
minus 2x, and then I have a 1 plus a 1, right? Minus a negative is a plus 1. It's okay. And then I just do another FOIL. And combine them again. Uh, so that's plus 2x squared, and then minus 6x, and then I still have that 8 rattling around. But that should be my polynomial. What's the worst part? The multiplying everything out. The piece where I actually use my properties from this chapter is pretty easy. Right, to get the factored form of the polynomial. Not so bad. The tedious part was multiplying the whole thing out because that was a lot of foiling in a lot of places, right? But the majority of your points are just constructing that first, you know, factored form. You know, if it's a three point problem, I'd say one point is the foil, two points is getting that. You know what I mean? So you still get most of your stuff, even if you have trouble foiling it out. I don't know. I'm just saying hypothetically. I don't remember how many points. You think I remember that? <laughs> I wrote that thing like a month ago. I mean, I'm smart, but my memory, eh, you know, when it comes to detail like that, it's like, shoot, I don't know. Um, does that feel okay, though, Jack, what we did there? Uh, what changes if I had something like a leading coefficient of 2? All I do is that, and then I have to distribute that 2 at the very end, you know, so it would come all the way down to here, and then we just, you know, do one of those guys. Is that okay? <laughs> Not being real helpful or communicative this morning, but that's okay. It's Monday morning. Jay, 43 from the homework? Sure. Okay. Um, so it says, find all the zeros for the function. Uh, one thing I notice straight away that can make my life a little bit easier, if I look at all the coefficients there, what do you notice? Yeah, for 43, they're all divisible by 4. So I would probably straight away just divide everything by 4. is that's going to make my life a little bit easier if the numbers are a little bit smaller, right? So from the fundamental theorem of algebra, I know I'm looking for three zeros because the exponent is, or the degree on the polynomial is three, the biggest exponent is three. Uh, my possible rational zeros are going to be factors of four divided by factors of three, which now that we divide by four, whoo doggy, that makes life a little bit easier, right? So I have plus or minus 1, 2, and 4, and then plus or minus 1 over 3, 2 over 3, and 4 over 3. And then we're going to go to our graph and take a look at what we see there. So we'll just fire up this old graphing calculator, type this bad mama jamma in, Oh, well, I, why, what am I doing here? Type in the simpler version, Kulik. You know, I was just, it's Monday morning. Excuse me if my brain's not going at 100% yet. It's like a diesel engine needs a minute to warm up. It's a weird analogy, but okay. And then I hit zoom standard there because I wasn't uh, 
It's been a minute since I've graphed anything. I wasn't sure what the window was. Um, probably your windows are all sensible. So if I look at this, let's see here, that looks like, well, let's take a little closer look here. So I'm going to go from like negative one to three or something here on the X, just to get a better idea of what's going on. So let's see, what's that look like? This is negative one and that's zero. This looks like maybe either negative two thirds or negative a half. Agreed. Um, probably not the one I'd want to start with since I'm not sure. This one though, there's really only one possibility. If this is one and this is two, that would have to be positive four-thirds, right? Now, do you notice anything about this zero and this zero? Look at the way they're intersecting the x-axis. This one's going straight through while this one's kind of hitting it and then going back. That tells me something. Yeah, this one's a bounce, exactly right. This one's a straight. I know straights are just used once, but bounces could be used two times, four times, etc. So this is probably, I'm gonna be doing the synthetic division with four thirds possibly, I could possibly do that more than once. Okay, so, I would start with this one because I'm pretty positive that's got to be four thirds. Yeah, Victoria? Sure. So I'll set up my synthetic division. It's four. That's negative four. And that's negative four. So that worked. Now, this at this point, I have two options. I can exit my synthetic division and use the quadratic formula here. Or I can continue on with my synthetic division, which is what I would probably choose to do since I'm pretty sure 4 thirds is going to be used twice. So what's that give me? Hmm, uh, not what I was looking for, huh? Well, I guess we better do the quadratic formula. Yes, sir. Uh, you can always try to do another synthetic division if you have stuff on your calculator that looks like stuff on your list. It doesn't guarantee that the stuff you're seeing on the calculator is actually things on your list and that it'll work, which is what happened to us here. But I figured um, that's what's happening and probably what's happening is that this isn't actually a bounce. If we go and we zoom in really closely, I bet there's something that's also just really close to that which is kind of a bummer. We'll see when we do the synthet or we do the uh, the quadratic formula here. And I'll point out to you exactly what's going on. Um, so that's 936 plus 9. So 36 plus 9 is 45. And the square root of 45 is can be simplified, right? Because 45 is 9 times 5. So the square root of 9 times error is 3. And then the square root of 5 there. And then I can reduce that, right? That just becomes 1 plus or minus root 5 over uh, 2. 
And just to illustrate to you guys what's going on here. I bet 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 is pretty close to 1.3. Yeah, it's pretty close going on there. So what's happening is there's probably two x-intercepts here. And just like if we zoomed in really closely, we could see them. So just to illustrate to you what's going on. And this is the sneaky part, right? Is Mr. Kulik, you can give me a polynomial where just like sneaky stuff happens. Did I pick the... No, oh, I'm dumb. I would want to be women too. Sorry. So here's me zooming in to that area, and it's actually not a bounce. It's two separate x-intercepts that are just really close to each other, which is kind of a sticky wicket there. But the good news is that the quadratic formula, because we we're down to a quadratic, wasn't going to screw that up, right? Even if we tried to do the synthetic division, it didn't work. You just backtrack to the quadratic formula, and it'll be, we'll catch it. So we have this answer and then um, four-thirds. Those are my zeros then. Does that feel okay, Jay? So this one was a sneaky calculator one because the graph kind of gave you two that possibilities that looked like they should work and they end up not really working. If you had tried to use the negative one-half or negative two-thirds, it also would have failed the synthetic division um, because the uh, if I did the one minus root five over two, I bet that's yeah, really close to negative two thirds, but not at, you know. So that's what you're seeing over there. It wasn't exactly so. Just just a tough one because the irrational values are very close to things that are on our list, which is one of the reasons why we actually have to do the synthetic division, and we can't just be like, oh yeah, that looks like negative two thirds. I have that on my list. Let's just write that down. It's like, well, no. Does that feel okay? And we talked about this one now quite a bit. It wasn't, there wasn't that much like arithmetic to do, but there's kind of a lot of talking to do about hypothetical and kind of what was going on. Um, who's next? It's kind of, they're all kind of the same, right? Once you kind of got it, it's like, yeah. Even if I mess this up a little bit, I can't mess it up too bad because I understand what's going on. You know what I mean? Like even if you make some like little arithmetic mistake stuff, it doesn't get too bad. All right. Um, so today then, with the rest of our time, we're going to start chapter 15. which is all about um, exponential logarithmic and logistic functions. So again, this is a little bit of a revisit from things that we did last year. So last year, we definitely talked about exponential functions. And we definitely talked about logarithmic functions. We didn't talk about logistic, which we'll talk about new this year. So that part will be new. Uh, but also in my experience, the logarithm piece is probably the least understood piece of content we do in Algebra 2 by Algebra 2 students. So like even though we've done that before, yeah, you might be getting to the point to be like, I don't remember doing this because it's kind of the piece that happens kind of at the end of the year and doesn't seem to stick very well. Again, I've been doing this for a while, so that's just my experience. So we'll redo that part also and maybe extend some of those ideas a little bit, but not much past what we did last year. But 
it's okay because that part we did last year typically didn't stick real well. So, and no big deal. All right. Today, though, we're just going to be talking about exponential and logistic functions. And I even think that uh, we don't even get finished with exponential stuff and what I was planning on doing today because I wasn't planning on doing like a monstrous amount of stuff considering we have a test next period and on something else. So I didn't want to like go bananas here. Um, we're just going to start with a couple of light definitions. So we have first our exponential function. So our exponential function can be written in the form a times b to the x, where a is not 0, b has to be positive, and not equal to 1. As a separate piece of vocab here, the a coefficient, we will call the initial value frequently, and the b we'll call the base of the exponential. So just as a quick aside, uh, we have some constraints here on our exponential function. A can't be 0, B has to be positive and not equal to 1. Why do you think we are not allowing A to be 0? What would happen if A is 0? The whole thing becomes 0, and that's a constant function, which is a kind of linear function that we're not interested in including here. Good. Uh, what would happen if b was equal to 1? What's 1 to any power? 1. So you just have a times 1, which is a. That's a constant function. Again, not a, that's a type of linear function. We don't want to include that here. Everybody's cool with that? Why does b have to be positive? What would happen if B was negative? So B would be negative, right? And X is a variable. What kind of numbers could you put in for X? Anything you wanted, right? Specifically, what kind of number would be a problem if B was negative? It's things like a half. Why? What is the hat uh, exponent of one half the same as? We talked about this last year. It's the same as a square root. So things like a half or a fourth or an eighth, now you're talking about taking an even root of a negative number, which gives you an imaginary result, and we can't plot those things. It's just not what we're interested in doing. Okay with that? So that's why we have all those extra requirements so that we don't end up actually describing a linear thing or something that just like all over the place. You're having these like imaginary pieces so the thing's disconnected all over the place and it just would be a weird, 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 weird looking thing. Okay. Um, so let's just talk for a moment. Um, about some like 
a side piece. So let's say I have um, the function y times or y equals 5 times 4 to the x. Can I write that as 20 to the x? No! Definitely not. Why not? What? Yeah, so that you'd be violating the order of operations is what Landon's saying, that we have to worry about that exponent of the x before we can do the multiplication. What would be okay... is 5 to the x times 4 to the x is 20 to the x. So if the exponent is the same, you can just multiply the bases and keep the exponent. What else could you do? If the bases are the same, you can keep the base the same and add the exponents. Right, That's, those are your rules for multiplying exponentials. If the exponent's the same, you can multiply the bases, keep the exponent. If the bases are the same, you can keep the base and add the exponents. Everybody's okay? I just need to cover that. Um, okay. And then, oh, I guess one other thing. Are these the same? No. This is a little bit ambiguous. Does this mean we're going to take 4 to the x and then divide by 3? Or we're we talking about 4 thirds to the x? right? Not the same. This is probably the one that we're going to mean. So we have to be a little bit careful with writing our parentheses when we deal with a fraction and an exponent. Okie dokie. Okay. Just wanted to touch that for a moment. Okay, so let's just look at an example. Let's say our exponential function is f of x equals negative 2 times 4 to the x. And we want to evaluate f of 2, f of 0, f of negative 3, f of 1 half, f of negative 3 halves. So what does it mean when I write like f of 2 like this? Just plugging the number inside the f into the x spot, right? Now, which do I do first? Multiplication or the exponent? Exponent, I know, guys, I know. But if we don't review it now, somebody's going to be like, oh, I didn't know that. It's like you did because you've done it for like the last six years of math or more, but we're going to just make, we're going to eliminate that excuse, right? Unless they say they were gone because they thought it was the test today and they're like, oh, I can't take the test today. I'm just going to skip. But they should have watched the video, right? All right. Uh, next one, we're going to put the zero in. Oh, no. What's four to the zero mean? Not zero. It's one. 
So the rule there that we're needing is that like anything to the zero power is equal to one other than zero. Zero to the zero is undefined. Okay, so if I do the next one, uh, I have four to the negative three. Ooh, what does it mean when I have a negative exponent? Who remembers that? We did this last year. It means a reciprocal. Again, as long as that base for your exponential isn't zero. Obviously, zero to the negative power is undefined. So four to the third is 64. And if I reduce that, I get one over 32. Okay, oh, four to the one half. What the heck does that mean? What does a one half exponent mean? We literally just talked about this. You should remember from last year also. Exponent one half means square root. So the nth root of a is just going to be a to the 1 over n. Does it help that we're kind of uh, refreshing some of these exponent properties? It's easy to forget these things. Although you shouldn't forget them, especially if you have to take an ACT in the coming weeks. Of course. Okay, uh, last example here. Wowzers, a lot of stuff going on here. This is the way that I would think about this though. So I'm gonna think about, I know that the product, well, maybe we'll write it one more step. I'm gonna think about that as negative three times one half, right? That's the same thing as negative three over two. And I know the product of an exponent is the same thing as an exponent of an exponent. We'll write that down in a minute. I'll write it down right now. So we know that four to the negative third was one over 64. We did that a moment ago. And we know exponent of one half is a square root. And maybe we can write that as well. Right? That the radical of a fraction is just you know, the radical of the numerator, radical of the denominator. So when I multiply the negative 2 and the 1 eighth, I get negative 1 fourth. So these guys are just like little leftover properties of things, either radicals or exponents that we've talked about in previous classes that, hey, maybe that's not super familiar anymore. So just kind of mentioning them as we go. I'll continue to do that if we bust out some other properties that we haven't talked about yet. 
I'll just kind of write it to the side and highlight it for you so you can put it on your list of things that like, oh yeah, Mr. Kulik says I should remember this. I better write this down and so I can put it on my to remember pile. Okay, everybody feel okay here? All right. Um, so what if we wanna go the reverse? What if I give you some values like a table of values and ask you to come up with the function. Okay. So what's our exponential function look like? Right, it's a times b to the x. So really what do I need to find? I need to find an a and a b. Well, this problem actually turns out to be quite easy because I have this piece. So if I plug those in, I have 3 equals a times b to the 0. And what's b to the 0 got equal? 1. How do I know b isn't 0? My definition of an exponential function says b has to be greater than 0. So it's okay that b to the 0 is 1. I'm positive that's not undefined. It has to be 1. So I know a is 3. Everybody's cool there? Now I'm going to pick some other point, and along with a, so I can say 15 is equal to 3 times b to the first. So b has to be 5. Yeah. So if I take these and put them together, my function is, oh, I guess we called it g of x in the problem, is 3 times 5 to the x. Is that the same thing as 15 to the x? No! A little bit more enthusiasm, people. Um, I'd like to point out to you that we could also do this on our graphing calculator. And we already know how to do this problem on our graphing calculator. We talked about it in a previous chapter. So if I go and I enter this data into my calculator and then do the exponential regression, I should get this same equation to come out. So a stat. And then from the Edit tab, I'll press the Edit button. I'll type the x values here into L1. And I'll type the y values then into L2. Exit out of there. And then press Stat calc and scroll down till I find that exponential regression option. I put my x's in L1, I put my y's in L2. I'm not going to be asked to do anything more with this, so I don't got to worry about storing it. And it says the a is 3, the b is 5, and the r's are both exactly 1, which means that it's a perfect fit. Everybody cool? You kind of remember doing this from a couple chapters ago? <clears throat> Again, don't have to do it that way, but I want to point out that it's a good way to kind of check your work. What if, uh, what if we make this problem a little bit more difficult? Okay, what if we say, okay, We're going to give you two points, 
but neither of them is that zero, the one where the x coordinate is zero. What can I do here? Yeah, I'm going to make a system of two equations. So I'm going to use this to make one point, or one equation. I'm going to use this point to make the other equation. Those are going to be a system of two equations. I'm going to label those as equation A and equation B. Now, how did we solve systems of equations here a couple chapters back? We talked about two major methods. Does anybody remember those two names of those two major methods? Substitution and elimination, that's exactly right. Either one of them is reasonable to use here. Personally, I like to use elimination on these problems. But notice here, because the variables are being multiplied together, to do elimination, instead of adding the equations together, I'm going to have to be dividing. Okay? So the way I typically like to do it is the one with the bigger exponent. I like to be the numerator of my division problem. So if I do that, I have 12 over 48 equals a times b to the negative 1 over a times b to the negative 3. So far, so good. Well, the a's reduce. 12 over 48 is 1 fourth. And then how do I do something like this? Well, we had a property for exponents that you should remember from last chapter, that the quotient of two exponentials is the difference of exponents. So here this is going to be b to the negative 1 minus negative 3, which is just 2. Yes, sir. Of course. Okay, so how are we going to get the b by itself? It's b squared right now. Square root. Okay, now when we square root both sides of an equation, we get a plus or minus. But in this case, we know that really the one we want is the positive one. Why? Because... The way we defined our exponential function, b has to be positive. Exactly right. So just b is one half. And once we have that, then we can plug that into any of the equations and solve for um, a. I'd like to point out to you that, again, we could do the same thing we did before on our calculator and use an exponential regression to solve this. So if I go back in and enter the data into my list, just typing the x coordinates into L1 and the y coordinates into L2. And then stat calc, scroll down till I find exponential regression, enter, 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 enter. So it tells me the a is 6, the b is a half, and the r's are both exactly 1, so it's a perfect fit. Well, I guess 1 or negative 1. It's a perfect fit, so looks pretty good, right? Well, here's the thing. If we're asking you to do an equation where I'm asking you to write the equation that passes through these points, it'll be 1 or negative 1 unless you 
type something in wrong in your calculator. Like instead of typing 12, you typed 11 or something. Um, and actually for one like this, where you have only two points, you can always, it'll always find a perfect fit. Even if you typed in the wrong numbers, which is kind of unfortunate, but it'll give you like the A and B would be like crazy decimals, which is not wrong per se. Like I could give you a problem where they just start crazy decimals. Um, this one though, if your R wasn't one or negative one, it just meant that you probably typed a number in wrong into your lists. Um, if it wanted to write the exponential model to describe this data, then you could get R values that weren't one. But if it's like write the equation for this data, it just, equation implies it's a perfect fit as a model is an approximate fit. You know what I mean? So just like verbiage there. Does that feel cool? And this is where I wanted to stop today because, yeah, you know, like this little foot warming, right? Before we get into the next thing, which is going to kind of take a minute to, to describe. And I just didn't want to get into it if we didn't have to. Um, worth pointing out to you guys, this section is a big beefy boy. So we're going to, we're going to be here for a, for quite a bit. Um, So, you know, just sink on in. We'll be, we'll be talking about this chapter for a bit. Um, pop, probably, what, what's when spring break get here? Like two weeks. So we have all of this week. We have all of next week, and then we have half of the week after. Yeah, no way we're finishing this before then. So probably won't have a test till after spring break or something, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of play that by ear. I don't, I know that week before spring break sometimes gets a little crazy test wise anyways. So we'll, uh, we'll just kind of play that by ear where I'm sitting right now. It seems doubtful that we'd have a test before it'll probably be after, but probably a homework quiz before though. Yes, that's a fair, that's a fair assumption. Okay. Uh, everybody cool? We happy? Happy enough? So happy.